in a commercial manufacturing or limited manufacturing or general manufacturing areas just means that there may not be as suitable for parking or lighting or things of that nature um, for consideration on that. But there are cities that, you know, start as co-op and collective that do have retail in those other zones other than your retail zones. Okay, thank you. I, I think Linda has another yep. comment or question. David, you know, back a few years ago when, when this just all started, uh, it, it was illegal sales versus dispensaries, so everybody went and got their medical card or whatever so that they could go buy pop of any kind. Are there really any dispensaries per se left, or is it just all recreational use and that's where you buy it? I, 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 I bring up a point of, of a store in Palm Springs that was a dispensary, and it was more like a, a pharmacy, and it was, I mean, it was, it was actually quite impressive. Uh, but, I mean, since you don't, since recreational marijuana is legal, why would you need a medical card to go buy it? And so it would just be a regular retail store. That's and that was part of what I mentioned earlier, that um, people just don't want to have to go through those hoops. They'll pay the extra additional fees or tax on it to have it be at a regular cannabis store versus only buying it medicinal for medicinal and have to get a doctor's recommendation and go through that process. Okay. So, Mayor, I think I heard a key, there are a couple key themes, and I just want to make sure that I've captured them. Um, there was some conversation about, uh, you know, obviously there's a demand side and a market side to what uh, the consumer is interested in, which I think you heard from David is on the re retail side. Um, in addition to that, I think I also heard council members state that they didn't want it near any sort of residential areas. Uh, in addition to that, I also heard that there wasn't a desire to have it any any commercial shopping center areas as well. Um, so less of a kind of shopping center with a dispensary right next door, some sort of operation right next door to that. Um, in addition to that, I think we may also want to consider uh, what the ability to generate some sort of revenue is for the city. Um, and I think those are all collective concepts that, that I think are very relevant to this conversation. Um, so with that being said, um, I did hear some council members state that the industrial areas may be an area that they would uh, prefer to have some sort of operations there. Is that correct? And so I think that, I, that identifies the area with respect to um, where should each type of business be allowed? I, I heard collectively that the industrial area might be an area that you would allow some of these operations. The other part is what type of operations would we want to um, allow? So if we think about it in the context of, you know, revenue generation, concern about residential areas and what the public perception of that might be, uh, less of the storefront kind of concept, David, what with considering all those items, which operations would be most in line with the cannabis operations that are, are laid out in the types of cannabis operations in number one? Well, um, to address both of those, I think one is we had a conversation a little bit about micro business. A micro business, if you say we allow a micro business to conduct um, non storefront retail, then they would be properly zoned. It wouldn't be a problem because you don't have walk in traffic, which would, you know, limit parking spaces or impact parking spaces. So that, that is a very attractive model and there's already, you know, expressed an interest in, and in the staff report, we also noted that various cities, I think six to eight cities in Riverside County are actually permitting that type of model. So you would be consistent with what's happening in your region. Then the next one would be, then that would address both your consumer demand, but also the other activities that could generate revenue as part of that, that component in there. The second one would be is, 
do you allow maybe even a retailer to be in the industrial zone on its own and based on their location demonstrate, you know, proper parking and other lighting and other issues of concern regarding the, the property that they pick at the retail side. The, the other side is, as we talked about in the SAP report, is the determine if you, you know, letting all the other wholesale activities to occur and putting a cap on it, that way you have control of the number of businesses, but you may or may not even get that number anyway. Um, but if you did, then you would have to, you know, opportunity to pick best of breed based on the, on the applicants that you receive versus the categories. So David, it was um, micro business, a retailer in industrial zone, and with the conditions that I think Councilmember Meyer brought up of parking and lighting and all those additional items, and then allowing wholesale activity with a cap on those businesses. Is that correct, David? Yes, as, as indicated in our staff report. Another thing is, Regulating the retail, I think, is important because I think we talked about this before, is if we have regulations on the retail, then it will help minimize the illegal dispensaries that we're constantly fighting also. So if that's truly still a fact, you know, being able to, you know, have cannabis lane or something, we can have the industrial area where they can you know, do what they do. But then there's people can go to get their business done, and then it would help what we told before, like people would naturally go to the legal businesses first, and so then it would take away from the illegal stuff. So part of what we're trying to do here with this initial discussion is getting the overall policy direction based on the direction given whether we allow micro business, uh, retail, or other wholesale activity, the um, regulation side of it, which you're alluding to, really gets built on whatever it is that we're allowing. So I hear loud and clear the desire to make sure that we're protecting any sort of retail activity and ensuring that it's adhering to all the rules that we want them to adhere to. That's how we build in those additional enforcement, all those other mechanisms to make sure it embodies really what the council would like it to be. So this first conversation is really that global conversation about what we want to do and we'll get into the details moving forward. Right, but my point is, is that we don't want to exclude retail because we're trying to regulate it. Right. Correct. Right. So, and, and I'm, I'm trying to drill down on some of these areas. So, as it relates to number one, I'd like to see if we can have council to provide that uh, collective direction on whether we agree that, uh, you know, it's micro business, the retail activity, as well as the wholesale activity that we can start putting some, some meat on the bones and move forward and bring some items back to council. Um, if that's the council's wish, we're happy to do that. If not, we can add or remove uh -huh. something. Um, I would say yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, David, you got that one? So, for permitting all types of activity. So, the uh, micro business. Uh, retailer, retail, and then the wholesale activities. So there's nothing being excluded from the list. No, because you've got cultivation, uh, manufacturing, testing labs, distribution, micro business, and retail. It's all of them. Yeah, all six activities. Okay. Okay, and then on, um, we talked briefly about caps and other it made sense to put a specific number or just put a cap. Um, as it relates to those items that the council just weighed in on, David, I think just dropped off. Um, we'll need to I'm still here. I'm still oh, here. Okay, David. Um, when it comes to those activities that we just discussed, what, you know, does it make sense to have a cap in terms of the total amount of licenses or? Uh, permittees across the board, how would we best tackle that specific item as it relates to number two? So I think you need to look at it in two buckets. The first bucket would be is 
what you want to see in the cap for just wholesale businesses, because that's really businesses that move wherever the product could be sold to. And the second bucket is the retail component of this, which is based on cons consumer demand on the, on the local level. And based on the population, we indicated that the comfort zone for that population in the region would be from two to four. It's just a matter of what you would like to see of that. Um, that just gives you a ballpark. So we mentioned in the report potentially recommending not to exceed 10 wholesalers of any combination and somewhere between two to four retail for the purposes of discussion. And then that counts the prerogative of what they would like to increase or decrease in that number. So clearly a higher number in the first bucket that David alluded to, the cap on the wholesale being potentially 10 or other number that council may want. And then on the retail side, a cap of anywhere potentially between two and four, if the council would like to keep that or have a different idea, a different number, um, want to just make sure we capture that. Well, you know, supply and demand, if we have less, then maybe more people will be excited to open up here. <laughs> maybe wholesale should be five. We can always change it if we feel that we have more space. We're going to have a harder time finding places, I think. Then. So wouldn't it be better to be a little bit more conservative and add two versus take away? No, I mean, I, I'd like to see how, what the dynamic will be and perhaps change policy at a later date, being able to include more versus having a set number and saying, well, maybe we should have only had three. On the, on the retail side. On the retail, retail side. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing I that out there. I, 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 I and this doesn't lock in the council in terms of required right. numbers of permits. It's simply just it will not exceed. So right. there is the flexibility mm -hmm. on that as well. Yeah, I think that's why I like the concept of a cap. Yeah. And, and starting, <laughs> starting small is not a problem. It, it's a pie in the sky that I think so many jurisdictions have in that this is a cash cow and it's not uh, and you you can't tax it to death because then it all becomes black market or gray right, market right. Or whatever, the color. so and I think I we have, have a to keep in mind the, the, the realization that based on uh, what David is telling us that it's being driven right now there's a, a dearth of retail and, and nobody's really interested in the cultivation right now. So we have to temper our expectations with reality of what, what's driving the market, too. And to not come across greedy. I mean, we're not, you know, if we say, oh, you know, we want 20 of these, but it's not corralled the way that we want, we could have a whole other problem. So. so I heard a cap of five on wholesale, and then I heard a cap of two on the retail side. I think we could go a little higher than two. I think three is probably. <laughs> I, I, I agree with it between two and four. And I mean, because. Instead of, I mean, we may, we may never get four. Yeah, we may never get four. Tim, David, could we ask your. <laughs> input on that based on our population and what your knowledge of the industry is, what's a reasonable number? Sure. Okay. To clarify, are we talking retail or wholesale? Retail. Yeah. So as I mentioned to you on the retail, we basically typically will look at around 18,000 for the population of your 65,000, if I recall, divided by 18,000. 5, that's roughly rounding off. That's that's four. You know, a good four could be sustainable to do a very quality um, of that. Um, on the other side, as I mentioned to you, is that that you know, and you mentioned the five, and that's your your target of on that is we gave ten because you may get a combination of those, but also you may out of ten, if you had kind of like recruiting police officers, you you start with ten by the time they start building out and running issues, you may end up with five because five of them may not make it through not being able to be sustainable. Yeah. Um, so therefore, so hearing a recommendation you can a little more, but not too many. 
So am I hearing a recommendation from you, David, of, of four retail as a cap? My recommendation is a baby step not to exceed four as a starting point and assess what kind of applicants you have. But if your desire is to do less, then you can, you know, if you want to find some control in there, but you could probably successfully have four of them that would be very, do very well. Okay, thank you. So, council, do we have four on the retail? Four. Okay, yes. And then on the wholesale side, what was the number that the council had? I'm not hearing anything. Say that in the microphone. Uh, I don't have a problem with on the manufacturing and testing and the wholesale side to, to go with a total number of 10. Because if there are combinations, I mean, it doesn't say we have to do 10. It's the maximum of combination of all of those things to 10. And I mean, my, my personal, I'm not a user of marijuana, I never have. The smell out of Desert Hot Springs makes me nauseous. So I probably wouldn't be a good person for that. But I don't have a whole lot of problem with the, the wholesale side so long as it doesn't permeate the community with odor. <laughs> so everything for me has to be hermetically sealed. So 10 here, uh, is there a consensus on the council on what the number is? And we're talking indoor cultivation, not oh. outdoor. So, indoor. So we can drill <laughs> down on that as we move forward. We're just looking for the broad okay. kind of category so that we can kick this off and refine that. So you're saying a cap of five no, retail I mean, and ten I mean, no, 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 no. overall cap for all kinds? Four and ten. Ten wholesale or, four, yeah, or retail. Four. Right. Okay. Just uh, yeah. Council? I'm good with the four retail. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think if that includes, if it includes everything like, well, we didn't, we didn't specify this, whether CBD would be a part of all this too. If CBD is a part of it, then I think 10 is really a reasonable t So again, Mark, 10 yeah. is on the whole not part. to exceed amount. It doesn't yeah. require right. the council to issue 10. Right, so right, right. Yeah, we got that. Okay, I'm good with 10. It's not exceed. I'm good with that. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. I just don't want them to say, hey, you have four permits laying out there and we want one. We don't have to. Sure. Right. Okay. okay, so David, we got 10 on that. <laughs> 10 on the wholesale, 4 on the retail. <laughs> so we're, we're, we got some momentum going. Okay, so uh, where should each type of business be allowed? I heard industrial is a clear area that the council was interested in having these locations at. And I personally am not interested in reducing the uh, distances that, it, that have been outlined by the state. Okay, so that's number four. So we heard the mayor say that he's not interested in lowering the buffers for the state. Uh, the council, is there any other input on that or is that? I have a question on that. Are are those buffers for all types of wholesale and retail, or does it just pertain to retail? So, so again, you can you can make them across the board, all state state uh, defaults of 600 feet, both wholesale and retail, or if you wish to to split them, that uh, retail be more or less, or wholesale be more or less. That's within your prerogative. Okay, well, let's go back to the one phone call we had on this who was interested in a micro business who said he had, um, I don't remember the first two, but he said that he would have delivery for the retail. Is The micro business would be considered as one, one industrial property. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to do that. I don't have a problem with these things being an industrial and what about like manufacturing? Because we have some some of that land that's way out west or out of land. That's all already zoned. 
industrial, farming, agricultural. We heard that. Is there anything else? Well, while we're thinking of that, let me just interject here because it's 7.20 and we're still, just for any of the public that might be viewing live stream or waiting on the telephone, I just want to let people know that we're still wrapping up our work study on cannabis. I apologize for the delay. We'll start as soon as we can. Well, maybe that's, is that good enough direction and then, because it goes to planning commission. So that's to, to kind of start assembling everything. Okay. So if we're not there yet, we're starting to assemble everything and package everything together. Um, David, so we've got industrial, we've got the farming slash agricultural areas. Um, are there any other areas that you've seen besides the commercial and the residential areas that the council clearly does not want to be near or around? Are there any other uh, zoning areas that uh, cities often consider? Um, in your specific zone, we, we noted manufacturing. You've got commercial manufacturing, limited manufacturing, general manufacturing. Are those three areas that would be um, part of that? Yeah. Okay, so we'll get those in there. Um, so council, is that a... Yeah, I have one question though, just really quick, I'm sorry. But in, in a lot of places in your industrial zone, those industrial shops end up being retail shops. And so a lot of times. So I've seen many industrial oh, yeah. complexes. Yeah, your automotive stores. Well, not just that. I mean, stores. There's, there ends up being um, anything. I mean, if they run a space, they can actually do anything That's fine, even per se. Yeah. yeah, in the industrial zone. So I want to be clear that, you know, um, we can expect that, and and that's okay, but we can't, I guess it would be up to the individual retailer to decide whether or not they would want to go in there. Um, however, the draw of traffic could encourage other retailers to go in, into an industrial center. So we have to be clear then yeah, Are we, on the city, though. We wouldn't say strips. I mean, if we want to say no strip centers, I, I agree with that. But very often those industrial centers become retail centers. So, yeah, so we have to keep that in mind as well. And, and I don't have a problem with that. It's just that the clarity between what is and what could be. Um, another thing on buffers, I don't have that slide, but what about parks? Because that would not be good to be by any city parks. So not David, city parks, I mean valley-wide parks. Now, does, the, does the state uh, include parks um, and buffers related to that? Are so, you, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, okay. so, yeah, so the, the, the definition we will provide you is a youth facility and what defines that. And typically in our definition, youth facility includes any places that have for kids' activities or occur, ballparks, soccer fields, you know, gymnasium or equipment or you know, all that kind of nature of stuff. But what you don't want is have a park, defined as a park, but it's basically just a big strip of buffer land as a, as a, a barrier to separate a street. Um, so we have specific things that we will share with you in the ordinance that we can, you can address and either add or exclude from that definition that will get you to where your concerns are addressed. Well, like for example, we don't want, want one by Weston Park because then it will just encourage the behavior that already we're already trying to fight in that park. And it does not have organized children activities. It has a playground. So the council could, if the council chose to create a larger buffer as it relates to parks in the city of Hemet, if that's something that the council would like to weigh, uh, consider. No, it, sound, it sounded to me like we have an, a lot of leeway in, in establishing buffer distances. Um, based that can on be included state. as, you can be as specific as that, and include that as a specific, specific as well. I'm thinking more of like we don't want to encourage the homeless people to be stopping in and getting marijuana and then going and hanging out at the park, just to be very specific. We're trying to get people off drugs. 
So we could somehow that has to be. We could include some language and work out some scenarios for that buffer as it relates to parks that we can incorporate and then obviously bring back. Um, if the council, I'm seeing a lot of head nods. Yes. Okay, so David, we can incorporate that on the buffers, and then on that too, I heard that we wanted to adhere to the state standards, and then we can add the parks language there to make sure that that's taken care of. Um, are there any other additional restrictions that we need to talk about as it relates to number four? Not too much time to do anything. Yeah, it's a good start. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on to the last item, which is item number five. Uh, what type of application process should be developed? How do we know? I mean, how, how do we I, know what that would look like? I think that it should go through the planning process like we have right now. And somewhere I read something like have council decide, and I don't think it was, like, I, think, I didn't think I read it right, but I don't think that we should be deciding who gets their permits. It needs to go through the, the process of the planning department like everybody else. So the, uh, there's a couple different scenarios so Chris, that laid out in the staff report. Uh, David, maybe you can just provide a brief overview of those because you know, there's different methods that have been laid out. Sure. So um, what we share in you, the, instead of doing a CUP, in the staff report we indicated a CUP is entitlement to the property owner that if you have a bad after and you boot them out of there, he can bring another um, an operator in there and because you've entitled it through a CUP. In the regulatory process, the goal would be is that you're giving a regulatory permit to the individual and they, are, they have terms and conditions they have to meet, otherwise you can revoke the permit as a result of them violating those permit things in there. Um, regarding the process here, um, it's not clear, as we talked about merit-based because you're limiting the numbers and if you end up getting 20 applicants for a retail store and you're only going to permit four, you need to have a process to eliminate to the, to the degree that you can of who the final best of breed is going to be. And we shared with you is that in that step three slide is that we would bring that whole process back to you to step you through that and get a little more clarity from you and it will address your concerns in the, in the regulatory ordinance of how it would be done but the procedure of it will be brought independently of that ordinance in that process. And, and so what we share with you, merit-based versus open-end, you know, lottery or some other nature in that, this process makes sure you get best or breed by doing a merit-based process, which is our recommendation. And I would agree with that because you want good actors and you want the types of businesses that would be um, – a good representation of how the business should operate. And so the merit-based way is really the way to go. Um, and, I, and I know that David mentioned in the staff report that, you know, HDL could also assist with that, and it wouldn't necessarily be a cost uh, that the city would have to bear. Uh, it may be at the onset of it, but it would be recouped in any sort of fee uh, that we would impose for an operator that would want to move forward through the process. So. It wouldn't be something that the city would bear. There'd be an opportunity to recoup that, and I think that's probably the best way and the best route to insulate uh, staff and the council on a process and getting the best candidates moving forward. Yeah, we definitely don't want a lottery because you have right. no control over who right. you're going to get. Right. I think so I, I fail to see the word process in there. <laughs> Application should be developed. Like, oh God. So um, if there's agreement, and it looks like there is. See head nods. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So David, looks like we got the merit-based uh, item that we'll, we can develop and you know bring these back to the council moving forward. Uh, David, is there anything else that we need to uh, wrap up uh, before we get off the call? Uh, no, I think we got enough direction for at this point. Unless the uh, city attorney has a comment. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate uh, your insight and fielding our questions. Tom, have a pleasure. To add? Thank you, David. Uh, Tom, are you on the line? Do you have anything to add? Yes. No, I'm still on the line. Um, no, nothing to add. Good discussion. Look forward to reviewing uh, a draft 
ordinance and the draft uh, uh, merit-based process, and would be happy to provide uh, any any comments or any any direction as well. Great, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you, David, and we'll be in contact shortly. Okay. Well, thank you. Night. No further business. This study session is adjourned, and we're coming up to our regular uh, session, which should have started at 7. Does council want to forge ahead, or does you want to take a five-minute recess? Okay. You good? Oh. Need a Okay. Good evening. I'd like to call the May 12, 2020 regular City Council meeting to order. I'd like to point out that this meeting is being hosted through live stream on the City's website and by teleconference for public comment. City staff is at an off-site location participating through video conference. If you're joining through teleconference, please remember to mute your telephone to prevent noise interference until your turn to provide public comment. Due to the structure of this meeting, I'd like to remind Council to please have their microphones turned on and positioned so the audience can hear. And Deputy City Clerk, may I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mayor? Yes. Councilmember Wright? Here. Mayor Potemkrupa? Here. Mayor Brown? Here. For the record, uh, Councilmember Mayor. Councilmember Percival is here on the line. Hey! Hello, Councilmember Percival. Oh. So we don't need a motion to excuse no, you. Good. Thanks for joining us. Okay, the Interfaith Council will not be in attendance today. The invocation this evening will be led by Mayor Pro Tem Krupa, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which I will lead. Please stand. Holy Father, as we gather here tonight, I ask for the guidance for your council, for your staff, and for our community. There are so many people who are anxious and hurting during this period of time of this pandemic. Please give us all the patience and wisdom to make the best choices for our community, for our businesses, and for our city. Praying in your name, amen. As we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And next on our agenda, we will have the city attorney's report from closed session. Tom, you still with us? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the City Council met in closed session with respect to the one item on the closed session agenda, and there is no reportable action on that item, and that concludes the report. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening we do have one uh, presentation. We have a proclamation for National Public Works Week. Public Works Week. And the city clerk just provided this to me. And it says, whereas public work services provided in our community are an integral part of the citizens' everyday lives and would not be provided without the dedicated efforts of the public works professionals who serve the city of Hemet. And whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water treatment, sewer collection, storm drain, utility, road maintenance, parks, public buildings and facilities, and fleet services. And whereas it is the public interest to gain knowledge of and maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2020 marks the 60th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Hemet hereby proclaim the week of May 17th through the 23rd of this year, 2020, National Public Works Week. 
Further, citizens of the city of Hemet are urged to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees to recognize the substantial contributions they make protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. And it's presented this day, May 12, 2020, signed by all members of council. And I just want to add our hats off to all of our public works employees, especially for the yeoman's work that they're providing on an ongoing basis during these difficult and strenuous uh, COVID-related uh, times. So moving on to communications from the public. There is a temporary two-minute per-person time limit for all general public comments on non-public hearing items. All who wish to speak, including council members and staff, need to first be recognized by the mayor before speaking. And I know that over time we have tended to be a little lax in adhering to this standard, but I'd like to emphasize that uh, going forward I ask for uh, strict compliance with this directive that allows everybody to have an opportunity to be heard. Uh, members of the public shall comply with adopted rules of decorum, resolution number 4545, a copy of which can be requested through the city clerk's office. and is also uh, available online. You may also fill out a form and submit your comments online at www.hemetca.gov slash councils chamber live and it will be read aloud. Submittal, however, must be done before 2 p.m. the day of the meeting. For those who wish to join by teleconference, you will be able to join by calling 888-585-9008. When prompted, dial 768-176-038. You'll be asked for your name prior to speaking. Remember, if you're joining by teleconference, please mute your phone to prevent noise interference until you're given time to provide comment. When called upon to speak, Please state your name and spell your last name to ensure we accurately record who is speaking and the item on which you are commenting. After the conclusion of communications from the public and public hearing items, public teleconference line will be deactivated. Public is encouraged to continue to watch the council meeting on live stream at hemetca.gov slash council chamber live. So we'll move on to public comments items listed on the agenda. Deputy City Clerk, do we have any electronic comments submitted to be read aloud for consent or discussion items? No, Mayor Brown, there are no uh, electronic comments submitted for consent or discussion items. And are there any members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on any consent or discussion items? Two members on the line. Uh, would any of you like to comment on any consent or discussion items on the agenda? This is Councilmember Percival. I do have uh, some comments on item number 21C, if I could. What was that item again? 21C related to the COVID 19. Discussion. Okay. You have um, in, in light of the recent um, county board of supervisors meeting on Friday, uh, they have rescinded the public the public health officers' orders and are not going along with the orders of the governor. I think it would be appropriate that the city of Hemet follow suit. Also, I think to take it a step further, I think that based on the current developments of the coronavirus and the fact that the um, outbreak is not anywhere near 
as bad as first projected um, by models that had a lot of different information put into them. Um, the fact that the recovery rate is over 99% now, I think it would be in the interest of the city of Hemet to rescind the current state of emergency and go about normal business. And the reason why I say this is because the, um, if we continue down this path of this being a state of emergency when there's a virus with a recovery rate of over 99%, what is the next state of emergency? Is it gonna be this flu season this winter? Is it gonna become a state of emergency and we've gotta completely shut everything down and create fear and panic amongst the people of our community? And furthermore, I think that it's bad policy from the state by threat and coercion of withholding funding to cities that don't go along with the state program. I think it's despicable that uh, the governor is putting cities in this position. Um, and I find it ironic that the governor has filed lawsuits against the, the Trump administration over the fact that the Trump administration is withholding funding, federal funding from the state of California when the state of California doesn't go along with the guidelines and the wishes of the federal government and now the state government is trying to bully cities into doing the same thing. The governor is not getting his way when it comes to federal funding and not being able to do what he wants to do at the state level, and yet he's forcing the cities to comply by threatening to withhold state funding to cities who don't want to go along with the program. Now, I understand that there's when there's a state of emergency, um, it gives us an opportunity to apply for state and local or state and federal funding. However, it goes back to this is, are we truly in a position any longer when the recovery rate is over 99% and our hospitals are not anywhere near capacity because the whole point of going on a lockdown was to prevent hospitals from going on a, um, going above the capacity and then not being able to uh, handle capacity and we're not anywhere near that. And I think it's time for the city of Hemet to take a stand against the state of California. I know that there's other cities in the county have, have said that they're gonna take a stand. However, I think it would be important that the city of Hemet take a leadership position and finally stand up to the state of California and say enough is enough. We're not playing games anymore and we're affecting the lives of our community and our citizens and the people that live and work in our, in our city and in our state and our county. And I just think that we're doing a disservice to our community. If people wanna to continue to stay in, 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 in quarantine, that's their own choice and they have every right to do so and nobody will judge them any differently for doing that. If they wanna to continue to wear a mask, that's their right to do so and nobody will judge them for doing that. But in the meantime, the city needs to open up. Our county has already taken a stance, stance that they're not gonna comply or that they've rescinded the public health order. And again, I think, and I urge our council to take a stand with me that says we're not gonna do it anymore because it's the right thing to do. Thank you for those comments. That's all I have. Do we have any other? Uh, and I would like to make a motion that we rescind the state of emergency res resolution. So, Mayor, this is this is Tom Jex, um, and um, it, so it sounds like the request is to add an item to this agenda to rescind the local declaration of emergency and. Um, since you still currently have your local emergency, even though this item is not on the agenda, there is an emergency provision in the Brown Act that would allow an item to be added if a majority of the city council vote to add it for discussion. Well, under, under item 21C, that is a discussion for the, for the coronavirus related. And since that is um, the, the, the emergency order is for coronavirus, I think that that would be an appropriate spot to put that. 
So is that a motion to add this item under um, item 21C, to add the discussion of rescinding the local declaration of emergency? Yes, I would make that motion. Okay, so just, just to make sure I'm clear, are you advocating that we uh, address that motion under item 21E, or are you adding an, uh, an emergency uh, motion right now? Well, I think it's appropriate that the city council address the fact that we're not, that based on the true factual numbers with regards to the coronavirus, I think it would be appropriate that this is no longer an emergency and would warrant rescinding the emergency declaration. And question for the city attorney then, are you clear on, is this a motion that we need to take now or is it a motion that would be appropriate when we get to the, agenda, the appropriate agenda item on the, on the COVID-19 report? So I think now is the appropriate time to take the motion if it receives a second and if there is a majority vote of the council to add this item then the council can discuss where it could be added. I think it could be added if the motion passes as a subpart to 21C or a separate standalone part as well. But I think the first step is a motion and a second to add an item to discuss rescinding the local declaration of emergency. And if that motion passes, then we can discuss where to put it. Okay, one, one more technical question. Would that motion require a simple majority? majority. Because you still have your local declaration of emergency, um, there is an emergency provision in the Brown Act that would allow you to add items if, if only a majority of the council votes to add it for discussion. So this motion would only need a majority voting in favor. Okay, so we have a motion made by Council Member Percival who's joined us by teleconference, that we rescind our declaration of local emergency. So Correct? just that that item be added for discussion. Added for discussion. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, we have a second by Council Member Meyer. Is there any discussion among council? Are we saying we're gonna discuss it during, as a separate item? or discuss it during the item 21C. Excuse, excuse me one second. We're getting an awful lot of delayed feedback of the live council. So if you're waiting to talk on the phone, please mute your phone. Okay, thank you. Bonnie, would you? Restate your question. So I would like some clarification. Are we indicating that we want it as a separate item or are we saying that it's up for discussion during item 21C? I don't know why it wouldn't just be up for discussion during item 21C because you can make a motion during that time to do it unless he's not gonna be on the phone the whole time. I don't know. Michael, Michael are you going to be on the phone? You turn it down. Hello. Hi. Council Member Percival, are you still on the line? Sorry, yes, I'm still here. Okay. Did you have a question for? Are you going to be on the phone? I did not hear what the vote was, I'm sorry. We haven't voted. Have, are you going to be on oh, okay. the phone for the rest of the council meeting as a participating member? I am, if this comes back as item 21C, I, will, I cannot sit on the meeting for the whole thing, but I can come back when 21C comes up for discussion. 
I don't have a problem discussing it. I really don't, because I'm, I think we're going to get some other information. So discussing it to me is, is fine. At 21C, after we've gotten the other staff report that we need to, to I agree. Add. Okay. So if we need All right, to, so we. It was moved and seconded. We have a motion and a second that we undertake a discussion of rescinding our local emergency declaration uh, as part of the discussion of 21C agenda item. Correct? Okay. All right. May I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Meyer? Yes. Councilmember Percival? Councilmember Percival, do you have a vote? Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Wright? Yes. Mayor for Tim Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. That passes unanimously. So we will add uh, that to discuss rescinding the local declaration of emergency under item 21C. Okay, do we have anyone Thank else? you, and I will, I will come back on the line when that comes back up for discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any other members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on a consent or discussion item? Hearing none, I'll move on to item 17B, public comment for items not listed on the agenda, but within jurisdictional matter. Deputy City Clerk James, were there any electronic comments submitted to be read aloud for non-agendized items? Yes, Mayor Brown, there was one electronic comment submitted by Eileen Flores. States, good evening, Mayor Brown and City Council members. I would like to invite you and the Hemet community to join Southern California Edison at one of our virtual community meetings regarding our wildfire safety efforts. As the height of fire season approaches, SCE wants to make sure our communities are informed and prepared. At the meeting, SCE will discuss SCE's response to COVID-19, 2019 lessons learned, 2020 wildfire mitigation plan, public safety power shutoffs, PSP, PSPS, customer care programs and resources. Two meetings have been have been scheduled, one on May 13 and one on May 21, and both will take place from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Flyers have been provided for each of these meetings. For more information, meeting dates, and how to register, please visit www.sce.com slash wildfire safety meetings. I hope to, quotation marks, see you there. Thank you for your time. End of comment. Thank you very much. Do we have any other electronic comments submitted? No other electronic comments were submitted. Are there any members of the public participating through teleconference that would like to comment on any non-agendized item? There are two members of the public on the teleconference line. Are there any that would like to submit a comment for items not on the agenda? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Gina Estrin, and uh, I uh, wish to talk about, um, actually it's a little bit tied into 21C, but um, in general. Um, the 2020 Census will provide much needed funds over the next 10 years for the San Jacinto Valley. I request that Hammett City Council and the library review my proposal that I submitted earlier today uh, to reopen the library and set up a census center there. The purpose is to provide a place where people may safely pick up printed paper copies of the census and get help. Or for those that do not have internet access, provide such access. The library is the perfect place for this because the library has personal avail uh, personnel available already and can provide online access at several computer stations. Uh, beginning April 16th, the Bureau was supposed to send out census takers who will work with administrators at colleges, senior centers, prisons, and other facilities that house large groups of people. The goal is to make sure everyone is counted. However, due to COVID-19, they have delayed the distribution of their census takers. This gives us a small window of opportunity to set up a census, 
center and the library. In my proposal, I did consider the space-safe protocols allowing the library to reopen and serve the library patrons and serve as a census center. The library may also serve as a check-in location for census workers that will be coming to our city possibly beginning May 27th, probably later though. Census takers will be coming here to interview homes that have responded to the census. Having all census takers check in and out of the library ensures that they have the proper PPE protection and to prevent spreading the virus to our citizens. Remember, many people may not know they have contracted the virus because they have not exhibited symptoms or were not tested for exposure or antibodies. If you adopt my proposal, you will have compliance with the state guidelines for safe reopening. Therefore, the library may safely resume service now instead of waiting for the California's fourth phase of reopening the businesses and group venues. Hey, ma'am, your two minutes has uh, expired. Okay. Can you wrap it up? Okay. I, I, all I just wanted to comment is that um, with the upcoming 21C, um, I really want to have you think about, yes, it's not maybe not mandatory, but I really think in certain situations, such as the library, with strangers coming and going um, and people that have not been properly taken care of, like the homeless and, and uh, others that, excuse me, may have issues with, like I said, internet access, it might be wise to um, have some of those procedures in place in those cases where you need to make an exception to the state and, uh, and adapt to certain general public venues okay, that th thank we can... You. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, but um, after, uh, your time is over expired, so thank you for your input. Sorry. Okay. Uh, there's one other member on the line who would have a public comment for items not on the agenda. Is anyone else on the teleconference line that wants to add comments on items not agendized? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to item 18, which is our public hearing. City Council's procedures for public hearing will be as follows. Staff will provide a report and clarification of items presented. The public hearing will be open for comments for those in favor of or in opposition to the item, followed by rebuttal to any comments made. Public hearing will be closed and the city manager may respond to questions raised by the public. The public will not have an opportunity to respond. Discussion will be brought back to the city council for direction or action. May we have a, a staff report on this public hearing item. Thank you, Mayor. So we do have a, a little bit of a change on this item. We do have Loren, our finance director, that will be providing the staff report. And I believe we do have Veronica on the line uh, that's able to answer any specific questions with respect to this agenda item or this specific hearing. Uh, there is one thing. We did provide this to the council a few days in advance of the agenda posting. Uh, we wanted to give the council an opportunity to look at this uh, because it is a document that has a couple hundred pages or near there, and so we wanted to make sure that the council had an opportunity to review that um, with some extra lead time uh, to review. So with that, I'll run out. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to provide uh, some information on the five-year analysis of impediment to fair housing choice and the five-year consolidated plan. So what is the analysis of impediment, or we're going to call it AI going forward, and why do we complete an AI? An analysis of impediments is an assessment of a state or a unit of local government's laws, ordinances, statutes, and administrative policies, as well as local conditions that affect the location, availability, and accessibility of housing. The city of Hemet 
receives a community development block grant from HUD for fiscal year 2020-2021. The allocation for the city of Hemet is estimated at $922,246. And the, the period for the AI and for the 